You're listening to The Peach Pit. My guest this evening is the drummer for the progressive metal band Canvas Solaris. If you haven't checked them out yet, they've had a long-anticipated follow-up album called Chromosphere that is coming out this month. Their new single, Black Drop Effect, is streaming now, so go check it out. Everybody, please welcome to The Pit, Hunter Ginn from Canvas Solaris. All right, thank you for having me. So I think the first question for, I have for you is really obvious to me, but I, I, at the same time, I have absolutely no idea what you're going to say for an answer. So what have you been listening to lately? Well, here, um, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I've been listening to um, Seaweed, um, a band from uh, Washington State. Uh, one of my favorite bands, um, I've been listening to them for probably 30 years now, but I've been revisiting some of their records. Uh, I've listened to um, uh, Big Black's songs about fucking lately, um, <laughs> Brutal Truth, Need to Control, Godflesh, Street Cleaner, um, Voivod's Killing Technology. Um, I don't know if you're fami- uh, familiar with uh, Deserts of Tron. Do you, no. do you know them at all? No. <laughs> do, do, do you know where Stratosphere? I, I don't think so. Yeah. The, um, so a Stratosphere is sort of a genre hopping, Mr. Bungle-esque band from Northern California. Their drummer, uh, Dave Murray, this genius musician who made a solo record called uh, Deserts of Tron back in 2003. Um, that name of the album is the lilac moon and been listening to that a lot again lately, uh, listening to, uh, cataclysms first couple of releases, sorcery and the mystical gates of reincarnation, uh, hum inlet, um, listening to a bunch of wax track stuff. I recently watched that documentary, um, which was really good. And, Listening to what is maybe becoming my favorite metal album of all time, uh, Queensryche Operation Mindcrime. Oh wow, that's I, a li- like uh, I mean it in the last few years. I, I mean, I've all I, like I love Queensryche up to Promised Land, but that album has really, really ascended for me, <laughs> becoming be- becoming something of an obsession, really. I, I knew that you would not disappoint with your answer to that question. I have so much <laughs> more music to look up now, and uh, I'm really glad I, I let in with that. But before we get into the band, I, I always like to get more of an idea of the, the person behind the music, and I always imagine people as being superheroes, so I need to know your origin story. So how do you remember, go back, if you will, to when you were younger and discovering that you had a passion for music, and you also seem to have a passion for writing? I do. Um, I I. I get into a few of those things like um I, I i grew up in a yeah what what i'll call a musical household um no musicians in the household but both of my parents were very passionate about music my dad in fact um had festooned our hot water heater with stickers of kiss and black sabbath and grand funk railroad Nice. <laughs> and so I, I kind of grew up in a hard rock household. And when I was 12 or so, I started to get into, I guess, what you would now call alternative rock. I got into Soundgarden with Louder Than Love, Alice in Chains. I guess, like, basically pre Nevermind Seattle. And I was really interested in what might come next for me. And uh, we had a great record store uh, in the town where I grew up, and I I kept pressing them for more and more, and I got into ministry, and I did the the live album, and the mind is a terrible thing to taste, and I said, you know, what, what next? What next? And they turned me on to Sepultura's Arise, and in Tomb's left hand path. And that was pretty much my portal into 
this world where I've lived now for 30 or so years. <laughs> <laughs> a universe, you could say. Yes. In fact, yeah, yes, in, indeed. It, it, yeah, it was, a, it was a wormhole into another universe. And when I met Nathan, who is the guitarist in Canvas Solaris and the other core member, we he he was playing in another band and we sort of knew each other casually but we'd never really talked to each other and they had a show and he and i were hanging out before the show and just talking about things and within the span of about 30 minutes we found out that we both loved cynic we both loved carcass uh dead can dance skinny puppy and craft work and we thought, well, you know, if two people in this little backwater in southeastern Georgia can love these things, then we should probably play music together. <laughs> so you were already playing drums when you met Nathan? I was, yeah. I, I, I mean, we, both of us had been sort of casually playing in bands. Um, and, and, and both of us had been, you know, studying our instruments, but, but nothing serious um, cause we really hadn't found, you know, musicians, um, who were sympathetic to the things that we wanted to do. And when we met each other, you know, it was, we sort of fell hard. Right. And the, the rest is history, so to speak. So the right. band started canvas Solaris begins and you guys are kind of like a, you put out two uh, demos with a vocalist and even Nathan did some vocals, didn't he? He did. Um, in, in fact, he did the lion's share of the vocals on the the first two demos and then we did so there there are two four song demos and then there was a, a final demo this song called the flesh sequence which is sort of the like the missing dna between the death metal era of canvas and the instrumental era like it, it was it's much more progressive um more technical and we, we had a, a dedicated vocalist uh brad jeffcoat who if you're interested in trivia um was actually a uh jeopardy uh champion for no one way. episode that's so crazy <laughs> well it doesn't surprise me that he was in your band <laughs> uh i don't know if i can get a quick answer for this but just how did you guys come up with the name so we were so when so all right so Nathan um and Jimmy McCall the original bass player were hanging out and sort of just jamming through some material and they were calling themselves Pickman's model um based on an HP Lovecraft story at the time and that was already a band name apparently so they called themselves uh Pickman's canvas after that. And I was actually reading um, Stanislav's Lem's uh, novel Solaris at the time and suggested the name canvas Solaris. Just sounded right. Right. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a big uh, Tarkovsky fan too. So yeah, it all kind of worked out and, so your interest in writing, did you write lyrics in the early days? Um, some. I, I actually, um, my professional background has been in commercial finance and business consulting, but I actually have two degrees in English language literature. So I, I, I'd actually sort of mapped out my life to be an English professor and life as it does, got in the way. <laughs> right. Um, and and it, I did write some of the lyrics in the early days. Um, and, and now, uh, Gail Perlo, our really, really talented bass player, has a black metal band called Gorging Shade. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to write some lyrics for that album, which will hopefully see the light of day later this year or early next year. Very cool. I'll have to look out for that. And and I, I'm an occasional essayist for radical research. I, I should be more active than I am, but uh, hopefully 
some of my other ideas will uh, come to fruition here in the near future. And I want to I want to talk about radical radical research, and we'll get there. But I have some more questions about the band first. Sure. So, in the early days, obviously, you, like we were saying you had vocals, and then uh, you quickly moved into becoming just an instrumental band. And it seemed really obvious to me that. That would I mean, when I listen back to the early demos, even then, it seemed like you guys were really ambitious with all the instrumental sections. And it seemed like the band was almost had to kind of hold itself back to make room for vocals. Is mm. that sort of what it felt like? Hey, th- yeah, thank you for saying that. You're, you're actually the first person that's ever said that. Um, really? <laughs> and, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, you know, at first it wasn't so obvious to us. Um, and, and I'll, t- I'll tell you what actually directly led into our becoming an instrumental band. We, we, we put together this little promo thing, um, based on three songs from those demos. And we actually had Jeff Wagner shop it to some labels to like, like 10 or 15 labels. And this was 2001, early 2002. And, and, and everyone at the label said, wow, this is really cool. We have no idea how to sell this. Um, it, it was the time where if you were playing death metal, it was Hate Eternal, Nile, Centurion, just like Blast Attack, super brutal death metal. And no one had any idea how to market us. That's right. It's really and, interesting to think of it in the time, the history of it all. Yeah. And, but, but it was kind of liberating in the sense that it, 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 I mean, Nathan and I basically sat down and said, look, if no one's going to put this out and we're just doing this because we love doing this, then why don't we just be instrumental? Because we already had ideas that were that would have been severely limited by having a, a vocalist of any kind. And and you know, like in the tech metal realm, there aren't a lot of vocalists who are capable of adapting to that vast range of styles. Um and and so we just said, well, you know. Let's just be an instrumental band. I mean, and we we both liked instrumental music. We had listened to Don Caballero and Breadwinner, Champs, but in the in you know in the metal realm, it was still kind of frontier territory. And Matt Rosinski from Tribunal Records and now Die Bomb, and our, our records coming out on Die Bomb now he was really, really open to the idea of putting out an instrumental metal record. And, but, but at the time we had really no notion of anyone being interested in, in pursuing that, you know, in, in any kind of like commercial sense, we we just thought we would be lifelong hobbyists. Um, but, Lo and behold, it actually kind of became a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I think of your band as being progressive in every sense of the word. Like progressive can mean, well, for a lot of people, it just means complex. Uh, progressive could also mean that you're just trying to experiment and try new things yeah. that haven't been done before. And then I also see you being as progressive as in just taking time to reach the places, not trying to shove it all into a three minute song and instead make it a 12 minute song and really get into something, Yeah, you know? Uh, so it just seemed, uh, was there like any sort of a concept or a philosophy that you guys had when you approached writing the material for an instrumental project? <sighs> I guess I would say the overarching concept was to be able to do whatever we wanted to do within the context of some kind of metal framework, like with, within some kind of idiomatic metal style, be able to do anything that we wanted. And for, for me, the second record, Penumbra Diffuse, was the first time 
that we really achieved that. Like where we were able to absorb all these different sounds and all these different styles and still do something that could nominally be called metal. I think of that being the glue that holds yeah. it all together. That, yeah. Yeah, that's the nail on the head, man. That's it. So uh, now let's get to Chris and Gail. They've kind of become pretty concrete members of the band over the years. Oh, but didn't didn't so. Chris didn't Chris just originally respond to an ad? N- no. So no? actually, we so Chris and Gail. Well, I, I'll get to Gail in a second. Um, Chris is, I think, four years younger than than Nate and I are. And he grew up in the same town, Statesboro, Georgia, and was in a band um, and was just a really precocious guitar player, um, really, really interested in getting deeper into metal. And when we lost uh, Ben Simpkins, um, who was our original uh, bass player and, and, and guitarist in the, you know, the, the first iteration of the instrumental canvas, I reached out to, to Chris and, and to Donnie. Like I, I'd actually played in bands with Donnie before that. Um, but I, I reached out to Chris and he came on board and he immediately, he was in a band at the time with Gail and I don't, I don't know why now, um, I'm short-sighted in a lot of ways. <laughs> old, old age has taught me that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, at the time, I said, we, we don't need a bass player. You know, we have Donnie. He, he's, you know, he has a bass Moog. He can cover all the bass parts with the keyboards. And Chris was just really insistent uh, that we meet Gail and audition him. And <laughs> so... We we never actually auditioned Gail formally. We we met him and we just kind of fell in love with him immediately as a person. And we, we were about two months out from recording a cover version of Corner's Arc Light, uh, which was a, a a split seven inch with the Pennsylvania band Pharaoh. And we said, "Hey, do you want to record something with us?" <laughs> and and that was Gail's audition, was recording that, <laughs> and he he did quite well. And after the, after that, he was in the band. <laughs> there you go, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Gail, like, I don't know. I, Gail's one of my best friends. I just adore him to death. He, he's a partner. Um, I I actually have some music of my own that I'm working on and Gail's been a really, really important part of that. So I, I, and, and Chris, I mean, Chris, I've been friends with Chris for, you know, 20 or so years now. Like we, we, we just have this really, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how I deserved to find myself in this orbit of these really, really talented musicians in this small little state. Um, but I, I, I feel incredibly fortunate to call them friends and partners. And obviously, I think in the early years, it must have been easier for you guys to meet in the same room and rehearse together, write the songs together. But uh, now you, you're all spread out a lot more. And I imagine you're sending files over the Internet and working separately on yeah. ideas. Yeah, I mean, Chromosphere was very much done that way. Nathan and I are actually still able to rehearse in person um i have i in the last couple of years i built um uh like a dedicated rehearsal space at my house here in savannah and nate and i are are able to use that but yeah for chris and and gail you know and it's not just the the geographical logistics of it but just life i mean like i have a daughter um Nathan and um, and and Gail and Chris are all married. Like you know, like like life's just more complicated. You know, I mean, it, it it's just much much harder to get together physically than it used to be. Uh, 
So when you guys try to write music uh, together versus writing music apart, what do you think some of the, are there some advantages or disadvantages to go into that? Yeah, you know, it, it, that's a really interesting question. Um, and, and I do think there are some advantages to it. Um, so like atom, like I guess um, cortical and atomized were largely collaborative albums. Um, Nathan and I wrote most of those together. Um, and then, so a radiance was kind of written with like everyone sort of contributed their own songs to that. Nathan wrote all of chromosphere, like all, all that like base material Nathan wrote. I mean, we all wrote our own parts naturally, but he wrote everything that like became those songs. And, and I think the advantage of that is being surprised by the other band members' contributions. Um, I, I, like, I, I am not sort of a, like a dictatorial um, band leader in any way. Like, I really, really like the idea of bringing in someone who's super talented and letting them do whatever they want to do, and then just being surprised by it. And almost inevitably, I am. That's a really open-minded way of approaching it. It's kind of vulnerable. It is. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I do, like, I think a lot of people look at songwriting as a dominant act, but I, I look at it almost as a submissive act. And, and, I, I, and I think that if you work with people who you trust to, to do their best work, really great things come of that. Okay, this is a really simple question. Now, who names all the song names and all of the album names? Is it all of you that's guys? That's mostly or? me. It's mostly you? Mostly okay. me. Okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> with your guys' music, is like you've, gone so many different places you've accomplished so many things musically speaking is there anything that you feel that you still feel is unexplored with this project is something that you still want to do yeah um and and i think that we're getting to that on the next album um i'm I'm not going to be too confessional here but i'll just tell you that a few of us went through some really, really difficult things last year. Like a lot of people did and some really dark, challenging music came out of that. And that's the next thing that you're going to get out of canvas Solaris. And I've long wanted to do something that was darker and heavier and the circumstances of 2020 sort of participated in that. So maybe a couple of blast beats here and there. No, th- th- no blast beats. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> so now let's get into radical research because if anybody's listening to this who hasn't heard of radical research, it's probably one of the coolest podcasts you can listen to if you really like to just dig deep into music. I mean, Hunter and uh, Jeff Wagner have such a huge a wealth of information in between their heads about every band and every subject that they go into. It's really just listening to them talk about passionately about the music gets you more into it. Even if it was an artist that you didn't really care about before I listened to the episode you, you guys did on porcupine tree and mm-hmm. I was just, just totally blown away by the, the amount of information that you guys bring to the table. So when you got, when you had the idea to start this, like how did this be, how did you meet Jeff Wagner? <laughs> So I, so, all right. So when Jeff left, I, let me go back just a, just a little bit. Jeff Wagner was like a God to me. Um, even before metal maniacs, I, I was a fan of his fanzine, um, symposium. Um, and when he became an associate editor at maniacs, I mean, that, that was like a banner day for me. I remember his first uh, issue, reading his uh, review of Anathema's Eternity, and, and it was just like to the moon. And 
when he left Maniacs, he actually supplied his uh, personal email address and invited anyone who was a fan of his writing to reach out to him. And so I did, um, but just as a fan. Nathan was a bit more enterprising and reached out to him as a fan, but also said, hey, I'm in this band, Canvas Solaris. Uh, would you be interested in hearing our uh, demo? <laughs> and and Jeff said, you know, send it to me, and all I can promise is perfect honesty. And we sent it to him, and he loved it. And after that, he and I started corresponding more and realized that we had an awful lot in common, not only musically, but we, we started talking on the phone. And this is like 2001. I mean, it's, you know, like when you still talked on the phone with people and <laughs> we had a similar sense of humor, you know, just tons of things in common. We just, we were just fast friends. And, you know, over the years, I think, I think it was like in 2015, I, called him and I was like, Hey, what would you think about writing, uh, like a book on Norwegian post black metal? <laughs> and he, he was into it, but at the time he had written two books. He was like, you know, it's such a laborious process. I mean, I'm just kind of over that right now. Let's just figure out another way to do this. And, you know, it, it kind of germinated. And then uh, I think in 2017, he's like, Hey, why don't we do a podcast? You know, we can sort of write about music too as a compliment to it, but we'll just continue these conversations that we've been having and we'll just record them. And, and that's how it happened. And, you know, it was really kind of about championing music that we both loved that we felt wasn't, you know, really it properly represented um, over time. It's, it, it's mostly older music. Um, there's some newer music, but it, it's mostly, you know, what we feel like um, is older music that has been underappreciated or like, you know, themes um, or angles within older albums that have not been explored. That's a really good way of explaining it to anyone who hasn't listened to it. And I strongly recommend, once again, anyone listening to this, go check out RadicalResearch.org and just enjoy listening because it's you're going to be blown away by the amount of information that Hunter and Jeff both bring to the table. Is there anything that you guys don't see eye to eye on and it's kind of become a continuing joke? <laughs> that, that's, that's a really good question, actually. Um yeah, I mean, there are things that we don't see eye to eye on. We just rarely don't cover them. In fact, <laughs> we, we keep sort of toying with the idea of doing some episodes, some sort of like, you know, A, B episodes where we talk about things where we don't agree. It's just that we, so, and in fact, we've had some listeners say, you know, do you guys ever disagree on anything? There are plenty of things. Um, I'll, for one, um, the Melvins cover um, of Kisses, um, yeah, uh, Kisses cover or, or uh, Melvins cover of Kisses Going Blind. Okay, we, we don't see eye to eye on that. I love it. I, I actually think it's better than the original. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, we we have a, a a lot of sticking points. I mean, Jeff likes a lot of more recent Fates Warning. Uh, Je Jeff, in in general, is more open to like recent metal than I am. I, I like my enthusiasm for metal. Sort of, I yeah, it, it it and it it is with exception, but it, just in like generally speaking. After about 2003, I find myself much, much less interested in metal. I, but I, but th th there's a there's a like a, a dimension of hypocrisy to that too, <laughs> that like haunts me because it's like, well, then you know, Hunter, if if you have all these issues with new metal, then why do you make new metal? 
<laughs> I, I think I need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just need a good album. That's what you need. <laughs> Something to really blow your socks there are, I mean, and, and look, there, there are still plenty yeah. of people making <laughs> great metal. I, I don't mean that, yeah. but like the, the way that like I use, like, you know, I mean, in, even in like 2000, 2001, I could find 15, 20 metal records every year that I loved. And now it's like, you know, three or four that I love. Yeah. Uh, it's, there's so much stuff out there nowadays. I think it's harder to it, be it, noticed and everything. Really, I mean, really the, the amount of content is just overwhelming. Yeah. You know, but the, the entire infrastructure of music making has changed so much. I mean, yeah. like, you know, 30 years ago, you needed a label, you needed a studio, you needed, you know, like a, a marketing machine. I mean, now, if you, if you have a, you know, Pro Tools set up and a couple of decent mics, you can have an album out in two days. You don't even need a guitar amp. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, precisely. You don't. You don't. I mean, it, yeah, every, I mean, everything's just different. And, yeah. you know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I, I like the sweat of doing it. I, I get what you mean. And I, 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 I relate to your lament, I guess that is what I should say. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, it, it, you know, it, it, it's good to find a kindred spirit. <laughs> <laughs> So you've written very sporadically over the years about music, uh, but you do have a passion for writing. So are you saving it for a book someday? There probably will be. Yes. Cool. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's on the horizon. Awesome. This is just kind of a staple question that I kind of ask everybody. And it's mm -hmm. just, yeah. I, what advice would you give to anyone who's trying to achieve their dreams? I would say that you should be as selfish as possible about your passion. If you make art in any capacity, you are the only person who has to live with the consequences of that. I would say I would caution anyone from, you know, commercial ambition, um, from, uh, you know, aspirations of any kind of success, do what you want to do. And I think if you do that, you'll be satisfied. This has been a blast. Everyone, you've been listening to The Peach Pit. I've been talking with Hunter Ginn, the drummer from the band Canvas Solaris. Their new album, Chromosphere, comes out this month. Their new single, Black Drop Effect, is streaming right now. Go check it out. Hunter, this has been a great conversation. I can't wait to do this again someday, so definitely don't, don't be a stranger. Will not be. Really looking forward to the next time, Derek. Great. Take care of yourself. You take care, too. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.